Hi, everybody. Can you okay, hear me? Okay, good evening. Welcome, everyone. The Torah studies. It is um, this week. It's Parshas Matos and Masi. This week we complete the fourth book of the Torah, the Chumash Bamidbar, Shabbos Chazak. And the topic we're discussing today, as I mentioned this morning, a very hot topic, if you will. The chosen people, the chosen nation. So I get it a lot. Why, why do we call ourselves the chosen people? Actually, we don't call ourselves God. The Torah calls us the chosen people. What does that mean in today's day and age, in today's political environment, is that okay to say? You are the chosen people, isn't that, isn't that considered something like a racist or a elitist at least? To consider yourself, you're the chosen people? And what does that mean? And then in fact, there was some Jews that felt very un uncomfortable with this notion calling themselves, I mean, some non-Jews felt that way, but I think more Jews who felt, why would we call, go around and tell us, call ourselves the chosen people? That will, <laughs> This will call anti-Semitism. People hate us because of that. And, uh, you know, Ben-Gurion, even in the, was obviously not a religious Jew, didn't have the real proper uh, Jewish background, uh, although he did many, many great things. But uh, in 1960, when he came, he spoke in uh, Brandeis University. When he mentioned about the chosen people, he says, you know, every nation is chosen in their own eyes, something to that effect. So number one, we got to make clear right up front, when we're saying that we're the chosen people, we're not degrading anyone. We're not dehumanizing anyone, God forbid. On the contrary, as we'll soon see, we'll, we'll learn that every person, every human being was, was created with the image of God. So unlike any other type of, of uh, uh, supremacy, people feel supreme that led throughout the history to so many troubles and, dis and, and destructions and people looking down on other people. In Jewish belief is every human being is treasured and, and precious by God and so on. But yet we cannot run away from the fact that the Torah calls us the chosen people and that's what we need to understand and that's what we're going to discuss in tonight's lesson. Because you cannot escape this. This is everywhere in the Torah, even in the prayer, every single day. He's saying the prayer, you chose us from all the nations, and so on. So let's get into it. So, let me just get to the beginning. There we go. There we go. Yep, so sorting through the myths. Who are we to say that we are chosen? Isn't this belief elitist? The toxic degree that happened throughout the history. And this is, as we said, this is a belief that we, is part of our belief system. It's everywhere in the Torah, in the, in the prayers, and so on. So in the prayer, we say every single morning, we say, You have chosen us from all other nations. And tongues, you, our God, King, have brought us close to you, to your great name with love. Okay, so what does that mean? What exactly are we supposed to do with that information? We are chosen, okay? So what's next? First of all, what does it mean? What are we supposed to do with this? So obviously... Our conception, conception of the chosen nation is in no way meant to dehumanize anyone else, on the contrary. So let's begin. 
So right before God gave us the Torah, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, to Moses, to command the Jewish people and instructed him as follows. He says, tell the Jewish people, you have seen what I did to, to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles. I'll come finish him. On eagles, on eagles' wings, and I brought you to me. And now, God says, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be to me a treasure out of all peoples. Okay? For mine is the entire earth. And then he says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what does this verse mean? So here comes the Sforno. The Sforno was a sage in the 14th century. And he explains what it means, this gula, to be a uh, treasure out of all peoples, what does that mean? It says something very interesting. It says, you shall be to me a treasure out of all people. The entire human race is more precious to me than all lower creatures. God is talking when he's talking about Sgulami Kolo Amin, that all the people are precious. They're precious than from all other lower creatures. Because the purpose of creation is fulfilled through them. Indeed, our sages of blessed memory taught in the Mishnah in Avot, Chaviv Adam Shenivra Betzelem, beloved are human beings, for they were created in the image of God. Nevertheless, from among all, you shall be my treasure. So what is, what is this Forna saying here? And he's saying on the one hand, he's telling us that really all people are precious. So when, where, do, where does he take it from? The words that he reads in the Torah, Vatem tiulis kula mikola amin, you should be a treasure from all the nations. The ad, adding those words, all of, all of the nations, that itself tells you that the nations are part of this gola. He could have said, you will be a, a, a gola, treasure. When he said all the nations means that everyone is special. And yet there is something unique and special about the mission that a Jew has. Now, when we're saying all the people are special, what is what are they special? What is the specialty? Number one is that a person has freedom of choice. A human being can choose, and by choosing the right thing, is fulfilling God's mission. And number two, that is created in the image of God. So that's what this foreigner tells us. It says uh, that all people are special. God, God's intention for the world is affected by human decisions. We can destroy a world and we can build a world. And this is true to every human being. And that is what's, what is so special about the human being. But in the same time, also, human beings are created in the divine image. Okay? But at the end of the day, even Sforna says that, nevertheless, from among all, you shall be my treasure. So what does that mean? What does it mean when, Hashem, when the Sforna says that, what the Torah says, that among all the nations, there is something unique about the Jew? Okay? So to understand this, we will 
talk uh, and about a similar topic, but a little different, and something that is mentioned in this week's Torah portion. In next week's Torah portion, as we said, we complete today, this Shabbos, the Chumash Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. The Bamidbar means, literally, also means in the desert. So we're completing the book that the Jews in the desert, Moshe Rabbeinu Moses is getting them ready to go into the Holy Land, the Eretz Israel, the Holy Land, the land of Israel. And the Torah tells us that God gives us the instructions and uh, it tells us about there is, some, there is a special land. And about the land of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, we also see it is called the chosen land also. Eretz HaNivcheret, Eretz HaMuvtachat, the promised land. So this, the Torah tell, tells us some instruction, and we're going to learn, we're going to look into it, what does it mean, the promised land? The Jewish people have, long, have a long-standing belief in the concept of a chosen land or the promised land. So, the Torah tells in this Victoria portion, you shall clear out the land and settle in it. For I, gave, for I have given you the land to occupy it. This, indeed, is one of the greatest mitzvahs. Jews travel to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel, throughout the generations, in, in, in good times, in difficult times. It was always, the land of Israel was never, never was it void of the Jewish people. Always, there were always people there. And indeed, even in the times when it was so difficult, people, Jews, tried to do their best to come to the land of Israel to settle in it. This is one of the greatest mitzvahs. And indeed, the Sifri tells us about the story that we will read about this is a mitzvah that weighs against all other mitzvahs. So the, as, as we see in the next text, the following story is told about Rabbi Yehuda ben Beseiro, Rabbi Masia ben Chalash, and Rabbi Hanina ben Achai, Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Nasser. They were working in the diaspora. And when they reached Flatom, Platia, they remembered Israel. And they cried bitter tears and tore their clothing in, mor in mourning. They cried the words of the verse that we just read. You shall clear out the land and settle in it. They said, living in Israel, is equal to all other mitzvahs of the Torah. Why is it equal to all other mitzvahs? On a basic level, there is because there are mitzvahs in the Torah that cannot be performed unless we live in Eretz Israel. There are many, many mitzvahs. In fact, 67 mitzvahs that can only be performed in the land of Israel. There's another text that uh, we find about the story of one of the kings, one of the kings of Israel. You know, in Israel there was the, the fight, the dispute with the kings, and one of them was Omri. He was not a good, he was not a pious king, to put it mildly. But in the same time, he was praised, and he had something very special that he was, he had the privilege that him and his children, he had three generations that happened to be kings. They were taking the reins, became, they continued their, their, their kingship. And the Talmud tells us in the Medrash, Tells us why was he why was he 
special to the point that he was able to get so much. And that and that the answer is because he built a city in Israel. And although what he did, why did he build a city? It wasn't for the right purpose, but the, it wasn't for good reasons. He, you know, he fought against the kingdom of uh, of uh, Yehuda. But nevertheless, the fact that he built a city in Israel that was something that, in the virtue of his, that gave him that uh, special thing to have his children continuing the reign. This is from the Tan of the Valley. Yo, I was once sitting in the great study hall in Jerusalem before the sages, and I asked, why did King Omri merit that three generations of his descendants would assume the throne? Something none of his predecessors merited. And they told me, we don't know. And I told him, rabbis, Omri merited to install three generations of kings on the throne because he built a great city in Israel. Okay. So we see, we see how special. We know the settling in Israel, the land of Israel. In the Torah, when we refer to the land of Israel, what is the Eretz Israel? The land of Israel refers to the Holy Land. What was it called before? It was called the land of Canaan, the Canaan land. Now, when the Torah talks about instructing the Jewish people throughout the Torah, we find when you will go to the land that I promise you, you come to the land. What is interesting is in that in this week's Torah portion, when the Torah tells us about the borders of the land of the Holy Land, the Torah refers to it by the name Eretz Kena'an, the land of Kena'an. And the question is, why? Why would the Torah refer to the land that we know, yes, it was the land of Canaan before, but now we're talking about the land that is given to the Jews. Why call it the land of Canaan? As we see in the next text, it's, we read it in this Torah portion, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, why? Why call it the land of Canaan? This is the land that I give you. As many times, it refers to the, the, the holy land, the, the land, and that's the question. If the unique Jewish quality of the land is represented in the name Eretz Yisrael, why does the Torah use the name, the land of Canaan, in our Parsha? So to understand this, to explain all of this, we need, to, we need to speak about what is so special about the land of Israel. What is special about the land of Israel, we're going to focus today on two elements. The two elements, what is unique about Israel. Number one, there is the factor that this is the land that is chosen. And God chose this land. Number two, it is the land that is, that is holy land. It is the chosen land, and it is the holy land. And we will explain. When we're saying that this is the chosen land, that means that God just chose the land without any reason. There's no reason when you choose something. God chose this land. As we see in the next text, 
The first element, Israel is special, simply the land of Israel, is because God chose it. This is from the Medrash. The land of Israel is cherished because God chose it. We find that when God created the world, he distributed the land to the nations and chose the land of Israel. But where do we know this? Moses stated, when the Most High gave nations their lot, and God chose the Jews as his portion, as it is stated, because God's portion is his people, Jacob, and God said, let the Jewish people who came into my portion go ahead and inherit the land that came into my portion. So that's the first element. We're talking about the element that God chose. There is no reason why, because when you choose something, as we'll soon talk about, when you choose something, you don't, you don't have a reason. Why you choose? If you have a reason, then it's not a real choice. And what is the second element? Second element is the holiness. It is the holy land. Now, what does it mean that this is the holy land? The holy land comes as a result that there is certain mitzvahs. There is special commandments that is associated with the land. And that is as, as, a, as a result of God's choice in the Holy Land. God, because God chose the Holy Land, this is why you have, number one, you have the mitzvahs that are, can be performed, the commandments that can be performed only in the land. And number two, also, there is the very, the avir, the, the air, of Eretz Israel is something special. When you travel to the land of Israel, our sages, when they came, when they came to the land, that they would bow down, they would kiss the, 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 the ground, the holiness of this land. So holiness of Israel is number one. There are more mitzvahs we can do there than anywhere else. We have the Beis Amikdash, we have the Karbanot, the offerings, the sacrifices. We have the laws of the, vet, the agricultural laws. When you plant, you have to take off tithing. And just like today, this year, the year of Shemitah, the seventh year, is a year, a holy year, a sabbatical year. That the whole entire year, the land and the fruits of the land is considered especially holy on this year. So there are many, many, many mitzvahs that are connected with the land of Israel. In addition, we said the other thing is that the sages assert that there is something in the air of Israel. And this is the sanctity that Hashem sanctified the land of Israel. As we see in this text, that's from the Madrash. God says, the land of Israel is dear to me because I have made it holier than all other, the all the other lands in the world. You yourself know that when the land of Israel was distributed to the tribes, it did not pass from tribe to tribe, rather it was distributed to each tribe separately. So, so that's what we emerge with the two elements that make Israel special. Number one, we said, it is because God chose the land. And number two, it is because of its inherent sanctity. And that means as a result that God chose it, it has its sanctity. And the Rebbe explains it. The difference between these two elements manifests itself, among other things, in the names for the land. So before we read it, let me just explain it outside. So what the Rebbe is, is going to tell us, as we said, 
It is called Eretz Israel, and it is called Eretz Kena, the land of Kena. Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is talks about the sanctity, the holiness of the land. It is a holy, a holy land, land of Israel. Israel is also connected with Yaakov. This was Yaakov's second name that he achieved, that he received that name when he achieved the battle, battling with the other side, with the angels. Sarita im Elohim, you ruling over the angels as well. And that represents the, the Jew, the way he stands in a very high place. And the land of Israel is refers to the land of Israel in that sense, the sense of the holiness of the land. And it's called the land of Canaan. And the Torah chooses to use that name because that's the land that God chose. God chose the land of Canaan among all other lands. So because God chose that land, you can call it Canaan, and it's still chosen by God, regardless of any special holiness that it has. The holiness came as a result of the choosing. But the land of Canaan refers to this piece of real estate that God chose for whatever reason he chose. But that's referred to as the land of Canaan. So let's see it inside. It says the Rebbe, the difference between these two elements manifests itself, among other things, in the names for the land. The land's sanctity accounts for the name, the land of Israel, specifically to the exclusion of other names, like the land of Canaan, because the sanctity really has no association with the land of Canaan per se. The sanctity has to do only with the fact that it became the land of Israel, land of the Jewish people. By contrast, the fact that God chose this land does not call for a unique title, the land of Israel. Names like the land of Canaan can also be used. This is because God chose the land already when he created the world elevating it from all other lands. You see, that gives us the explanation why God chooses the name land of Canaan when he tells us, you are going into the land of Canaan. Why? Why land of Canaan? Because he wants to bring out that this is the chosen land. He doesn't even call it the land of Israel. Land of Israel is after it receives its holiness. But he says, when you go into the land of Canaan, the land that I chose, when I created the world, it was the land of Canaan. And I chose that piece to give it to you and to make it a holy land. So this is what, this is what we came up, that Israel is special. It's called the land of Israel because I think they have it vice versa. The land of Israel is because this is the sanctity. The land of Canaan. God chose this land. God chose this land. That's why it's called the land of Canaan. So here's the answer to the question we asked. If the unique Jewish quality of the land is represented in the name Eretz Israel, why does the Torah use the name land of Canaan in our Pasha? Because God chose the land way back in the beginning of time, when it was still called Canaan, to evoke that special chosenness the name Canaan is something is, is sometimes used. In other words, what, what is he saying? 
the element of the fact that the, the, the land is a chosen land, how do, you, how do you identify that element? If you call it land of Israel, then you don't identify the fact that it's a chosen land. Why? Because land of Israel refers to the sanctity. It is the land that you do the mitzvahs. It is the land that you have the special powers. But the Torah also wants to tell us another element, that in this land there is the element of that this land is chosen. Regardless of any special quality that it has, it is the land that is chosen by God. This is when he uses the land of Canaan. God tells us, I bring you to that chosen land. And I know it's a, it's a very subtle difference, but it is important to understand because that is what is going to explain to us the next thing. That the same two elements that we speak about, the land, there is the holiness of the land, and there is the chosenness. There's no such word, but we're using it in this context. But nevertheless, the chosenness, the fact that the element that it is a chosen place, those same two elements we also have when we're, to- when we're talking about the Jewish people. There is the, the holiness of the Jew, and there is the chosenness of a Jew. The holiness of a Jew is the fact that a Jew is connected to God through the Torah, through the mitzvahs, God's commandments. But there is something deeper in the connection of God with the Jew. It is the fact that God chose us. He chose us and we'll soon see why he chose us. What is the purpose of the choosing? But the fact that God chose us When you choose something, you choose without any reasons why you choose. If you choose for a reason, because you're doing something for me, then it's not a real choice. It is the thing that impels you to to choose. But when you're doing something, Hashem chose us from the core of Hashem. That is the element of choice that Hashem has in the Jewish people. So these are the two elements to Jewish uniqueness too. The holiness element and the chosenness element. Holiness is primarily about what you do. Namely, leading a religious life dedicated to Torah and mitzvahs. As we read from the Medrash. So, because again, because holiness is about you do what you do, and, the, uh, and, and this is something that God gave the, uh, the nations of the world also. He gave them the chance to receive the Torah, and they refused. As this Medrash tells us, when God appeared to give the Torah to the Jewish people, It is not the Jewish people alone to whom he appeared, but to all the nations. First, he went to the children of Esau. Talking about the nation of Esau, it's all ancient nations, not not the nations of today. And he asked them, will you accept the Torah? They asked, what is written in it? He answered, you shall not kill. And they answered, the entire essence of our father is murder, as it is written. And the hands are the hands of Esau. And regarding this, that Esau's father assured him, and you, and by your sword, you shall, shall you live. So they said, thanks, but no thanks. We cannot live without killing with that murder. God then went to the children of Ammon and Moab and asked them, will you accept the Torah? They asked, what is written in it? He answered, you should not commit adultery. And they answered, master of the universe, 
Illicit relations are our entire essence, as it is written, and the two daughters of Lot conceived by their father. So Ammon and Moab are created by illicit relationships. God then went to the uh, to uh, and went and found the children of Ishmael. And again, the nation of Ishmael is not today's Arab nations; it is the nations of Ishmael, the ancient Ishmael. And asked them, "Will you accept the Torah?" They asked, "What is written in it?" He answered, "You shall not steal." They answered, "Lord of the universe, our Father's entire essence is stealing." As in the verse that states, and Ishmael shall be a wild man, his hands against all. Yado bakol v'yad kol ba. His hands is in everything. There wasn't a single nation to whom God did not go and speak and knock on the door, at the door, asking if they would accept the tale until they all divested and see the Torah to Israel. So, so, so when it comes to the, the aspect of the sanctity of the Jewish people, it is something that is dependent on the observing of the Torah. But when it comes to the choosing of the Jewish people, that's a whole different story. When you choose something, and we did, we mentioned this, we spoke about it a number of times, that if you choose, when we're saying Hashem chose us, the, the a concept of choosing is only when you have two exact identical things. If you're going to choose between an apple and an orange, it's not a real choice. It's either because you like the color or the taste of the orange or the apple. If you have two exact identical, th- identical things and you choose one, then it is you who is choosing. Nothing that is, co- that, that is up to the person or the thing that you choose, none of the qualities of what they have makes you choose them. Okay, so to claim to claim that God objectively, objectively chose the Jewish people forces us to say that there is nothing about us that would compel that choice. This reflects a very deep connection. That means that the connection between us and Hashem is so deep that it has nothing to do with any of our qualities. And that's the way the Rebbe explains this. Says the Rebbe, true choice is in this week's Lekut Esichas. Says the Rebbe, true choice is only possible when there is an equivalent between the two items in question. In such a situation, the person exercises his or her objective, obj- objective discretion and chooses one of the items. You have an, your, your discretion and you choose this item. Accordingly, due to the sanctity of the Torah and mitzvahs, the Jewish people and their non-Jewish counterparts lack, they lack equivalency. If you're going to talk about the Jew, the way he is connected with the Torah, then you cannot compare. And so, true choice is impossible. We are compelled to say that when God chose the Jewish people, he had nothing to do with their sanctity, rather to the contrary. It is his choice that that introduced that sanctity to begin with. 
In clearer language, says the Rebbe, the relationship a Jew enjoys with God as a result of his choice is from God's very core connecting with the core of a Jew. The relationship that is created due to a Jew's sanctity, namely through the Torah and mitzvahs, that are the will and desire of God, doesn't connect a Jew's core with God's. Rather, it is a connection predicated on something which is Torah mitzvahs. So what do we say? To be a Jew, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you observe Torah mitzvahs or not, you're still Jewish. A Jew is a Jew. And you're connected with, with the very core and the very essence of Hashem. This understanding gives us a, a better, a deeper understanding in a very famous Zohar that says, talks about the connection between God, the Torah, and the Jew. We'll see it inside. Says the Zohar, there are three knots There are three knots bound to one another. The Jewish people, the Torah, and God. <laughs> the Jewish people are bound up <laughs> with the Torah, and the Torah is bound up with God. I wonder if anybody reading this line has a question. When you read this line, there are three knots that bind us up together. We have God, the Torah, and the Jew. So you have three points that you need to connect. How many knots do you need? When you have three items to connect all three together, you need basically two knots, not three knots. If you connect God to the Torah, and you connect the Torah to God. Isn't that so? So why does the Zohar say that you have three knots? But based on what we just explained, this will make sense. That the connection between us and God, you have two, there's two, two ways, two channels of connection. One channel of the connection is us through the sanctity, which is the observing of the Torah and the mitzvahs. And for that, you have the two knots, God with the Torah, the Torah with the Jew. But then there is a deeper connection. The connection that God chose the Jew in, in a, from his core, from the essence. And that is something that bypasses the connection that goes through the Torah. It is the very fact that God chose every single Jew. So, this is it. The three knots, the Jews and the Torah, Torah and God. But then this bond bypasses the third knot is the choosing, God choosing the Jews. The Jews. Now, when does this connection and how is this connection manifest? When is this expressed? That eternal connection when is this expressed? It is the fact that God chose a Jew. It brings out in the Jew also a similar deep connection. And for that reason, he will go beyond logic, doing what Hashem wants us to do, whether it makes sense or not, whether it is difficult or not. Whether even if it makes sense in, in, in Torah sense, sometimes a Jew would go beyond, beyond logic at all altogether. This 
is an expression that comes from the very fact that God chose us, which is beyond anything that makes sense in the Torah. So our chosenness is clear when we keep doing our job, even when it's difficult. The only plausible explanation for this, for this behavior, behavior is that it's our very, that this is our very identity. And this is what the Rebbe says. When God in Lekut Esichus, in uh, 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 volume 11, when God chose the people at the giving of the Torah, it was a unilateral choice from the very core of the chooser. This influenced the relationship between God and the Jewish people for long after that time, creating a connection, not only by dint of what a Jew does, but embedded within, it, within his or her very identity. At the giving of the Torah, the Jews thus became servants. It says, Keli b'nei Yisrael avadim, the Jewish people are servant to me. A servant doesn't naturally want to carry out his master's wishes. Rather, a Jew is entirely identified to God at his or her very core, leaving all other elements behind. A Jew's entire identity is bound up with his or her creator. So this is, the bottom line is, and when we're talking about Jews being the chosen nation, what does that mean? We get the whole new understanding now, a deeper understanding of what it means that we are the chosen people. It is not uh, uh, something that you feel that you're, you're privileged. It is a responsibility. It is a, a responsibility that each and every Jew got by the very fact that God chose you. God chose us and he gave us a responsibility to bring the light to the nations, to be the ones to carry out God's mission in this world. Yes, every human being has a part in this mission. But our job is to influence the rest of the people and to guide them to this. As the Sforna says, says the Sforna, Rabbi Yavadi Sforna, and you shall be to me a kingdom of princes. You will be a treasure to me in the sense that you will be a kingdom of priests to guide and teach the entire human race to invoke God's name and to worship him shoulder to shoulder. You see, what is interesting is, in the Sforno, when he writes about this, he says that this will happen when Mashiach will come. And the fact is that in those days, when he, in his time, he lived in the 17th century, it was, something was impossible. It was not realistic. It was not it's not possible at all for a Jew to influence a non-Jew. Today, we live in a time that Jews have so much influence in the spiritual sense, guiding people, telling them all over the world, throughout the generations, it, it happens, but especially now. And that is perhaps because we live so close to Mashiach, we're already getting to there, that we can influence with the teachings Judea teachings. Look at the, the Constitution and so many laws based on the Torah, based on the Ten Commandments. We're always being, whether we chose it or not, God chose us to be the ones to lead 
this mission. So when we take this and as a mission, understanding that this is our mission in the world, there is no reason to feel uncomfortable with this concept of saying that we are the chosen people. Yes, it is like, uh, it's like the, the humanity is like a, like a whole body. The body has different parts. Every part of the body has a different mission, a different function to do, fulfill. And part, one, part, one part of the body is the head. The heads need to guide the rest of the body. The brain guides the rest of the body, gives it the, the, the power, the influence. So when you see yourself as a, as a chosen person, a chosen people as the head, so to speak, you're not going to go, it's not going to take make you look down on the hand or the heart or the kidneys. On the contrary, the head understands everything else has to be part. We have to be part to work and serve Hashem shoulder to shoulder. Except that this gives us the ability, this gives us the understanding that we are here on a mission, and that yes, God chose us for this mission, and there's no way out. There is a way in. Anybody that chooses, anybody that chooses to become part of this mission can can go ahead and become Jewish and, 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 and be part of this mission. Anybody can do this. We don't encourage anyone to become Jewish. We're not like other religions who try to proselytize. We believe anyone, whatever he does, is fine, is good. But we have that special mission. And of course, it is, we're fortunate to, to, have, to fulfill this mission. And we thank Hashem every day for choosing us and giving us this mission. Although it's not easy. How does Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof say? When he lives in the shtetl with all the sufferings, pogroms, problems, and this, always the Jewish people. And he says, I know, I know, God, yes, we are the chosen people, but can't you choose somebody else once in a while? <laughs> Yes, the suffering is also part of it. And the suffer sometimes when we realize what the purpose of it, we, we come out better people, better people from this. But yes, it's enough. And we say to Hashem, enough is enough. The suffering, we need already Mashiach, and we need him now. And we thank Hashem for doing, giving us this mission. And at the same time, we say that we need to see the fulfilling of this mission very soon with the coming of Mashiach because the world is ready. We are all ready for that. And let us hope it happens very soon. Thank you for joining. That's Hashem. We shall continue with Tanya tomorrow morning. Any questions? Everybody, I got a few. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry I was slightly late.